So uh, welcome everyone. So we've got uh, our speaker today here, Carolyn Turkem from the University of Oxford. Uh, and she will be talking today about the interaction about fast tides and convection uh, applied to uh, giant planets. And what I'll do is I'll unmute the display so that everyone can see. Okay, thank you very much. So you can go ahead, Carolyn. Okay, thank you, Sven. Uh, so everything's fine? Yeah, there's probably a point that. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So uh, hello, and thank you very much for having me today. So it's, uh, it's very weird because I haven't given a talk for two years, like lots of people around. So it's a new experience. So I'm going to talk about uh, the interaction between uh, tides and convection, and more part, I mean, especially about uh, tides that uh, that have uh, a short time scale. So I'll uh, I'll uh, let you know uh, in details what I mean by that. Okay, so um, this is the plan of my talk. I'm going to first uh, tell you what observational constraints we have on uh, how much dissipation there is. Um, when tidal interactions take, take place. And then I will talk about how tides are dissipated or how we think they are dissipated and uh, especially what people have been doing up to now. And then I'll spend a little bit of time telling you what I have been doing the last 18 months and uh, you know uh, how I have revisited this problem. And then I will apply that to uh, Jupiter solar, solar type uh, binaries and then hot Jupiter. So, um, what happens if you excite uh, tides in an object like a star or a giant planet? Then, uh, as is described here in a paper that was written in 1940 something, um, you get you get two type uh, two types of response. If you have um, if the period of the tide is long compared to the free period uh, of the stars, then you can use what's called the equilibrium uh, approximation. So you basically perturb a system, but you are saying that the system is able to adjust back to equilibrium on a time scale, which is very short compared to the time scale on which you vary the perturbation. So you can uh, make what we call uh, you know, the equilibrium tide approximation in that context. But the, on the other hand, if the period of the disturbance is comparable to uh, the free period of oscillation at the start, then you have uh, to take into account the fact that the modes that you are uh, exciting uh, are, uh, are not at equilibrium, and then you have uh, the possibility of resonances between those modes and the normal mode of oscillations of the star. So I, I'll talk about those two things, you know, uh, the dynamical type, which is, uh, and the equilibrium type, that they both exist uh, in a star. So um, you also have, I mean, you also have other kinds of, uh, of I mean, it's the kind of waves that you get uh, of two kinds. You have what we call the gravity modes, which are uh, modes for which the restoring force is gravity, and they're propagating the relatively stable zones of the star. They're evanescent in the convective zone, but even though they are evanescent, they nonetheless exist, there's a perturbation there. And then you have inertial waves for which the Coriolis force is the restoring force, and they're propagating convective uh, regions. So all of those modes have been considered in the context of tidal dissipation. Now, which kind of systems am I uh, am I considering here? What do I have in mind? I have in mind a binary system, of course, in which uh, either the two components are uh, stars. Uh, so I will be talking uh, in particular about uh, stars comparable to the sun because they have a big convective envelope, and that's what I've been interested. You also have systems in which uh, the central object is a giant planet, like Jupiter, and then the tide is excited by a moon. And then you have systems like uh, what we call hot Jupiters, where you have uh, you have a, a planet like Jupiter, which is very close to its host, host star, and because it's very close, the tide that it raises in the star are actually significant. So those are the type of systems I'm talking about. I am not here going to talk about the tides that are raised on the moon by the giant planet. Those exist, of course. Uh, you know, there are tides excited on Earth by uh, by the Moon, but and they, they are not negligible when it comes to uh, orbital evolution. So they do play a role, but it's not dominant, uh, and I won't touch that. Okay. So what happens when you have a tidal interaction between two objects like that in a binary? Well, if the body in which you raise the tides is not 
uh, does not rotate synchronously, like the Earth, for instance. It goes around itself uh, faster than the moon goes around uh, the Earth. So then you have a talk exerted by the companion on, uh, on the tides. That's again the case uh, with the Earth and the moon. There's a talk exerted by the moon on the branch that it raises on the Earth. And that leads to synchronization of the orbit. So that's slowing down the Earth. And ultimately, the Earth will rotate with a carrier which is the same as the orbital carrier of the Moon. And if the companion is massive enough, then this synchronization happens very fast. Uh, so the Moon is synchronized, the Earth is not. And most of the moons and stars in the binary system that I'm going to talk about are actually synchronized. Now, if the central body then is synchronized, what happens? Well, if the orbit is circular, then nothing happens. There's no energy dissipated, there's no torque, there's nothing. So tidal perturbation is just steady the kind that moves with the orbit. But if the orbit is eccentric, there's no torque because uh, the body is synchronized, but there's still energy dissipation. And this energy dissipation is going to change the swimming nature axis. And because you want to keep the angular momentum constant for the system, then that's going to lead to a change of eccentricity as well. And you could have an increase of the eccentricity or a decrease of the eccentricity, but it has been, as has been shown by Peter Wallenreich and the collaborators in the 60s, it's actually the systems that we're interested in, uh, you know, mostly in eccentricity dumping. So that's what I'm talking about here, eccentricity, eccentricity dumping due to the tides raised on the body, which, uh, you know, generally is going to rotate synchronously. Okay, so what observational constraints do we have on the amount of tidal dissipation that we do those systems? You have, uh, you have observations, I mean, you have constraints coming from the observations of binary stars. And here you have a diagram that shows uh, the eccentricity versus the orbital period for binaries, which are in the cluster called uh, N35. I mean, there are many examples. I just picked that one up, but they are, they are more. So all of those dots here represent, all of these crosses here represent a binary. And you can see what you see here is that the binaries which have the shortest orbital periods have no eccentricity. Whereas beyond some orbital period, there's just a distribution of eccentricity and you basically have whatever you want. So we talk about uh, circularization, short orbits are circular, and we define the circularization period. Uh -oh. We define the circularization period as a period below which all the orbits are circular. So that's a measure of how much dissipation there has been if this, is, if this process of circularization is due to the dissipation of tides. Now, why do we think that's the case? Well, because if you look at all the binaries, they have a larger circularization period. So basically here, we have the age of the cluster versus the circularization period. And there's a scatter that I will come back to later, but you nonetheless can see here that the older stars, like in the field and a halo, have a longer circularization period. And the younger clusters have a shorter circularization period. Longer older stars mean there has been more time for the, uh, the tides to uh, be dissipated, so you have uh, more circularization. So by measuring exactly uh, how much dissipate, I mean, by measuring the circularization period as a function of age, you can constrain how much dissipation there has been in your object. Because we can relate the amount of tidal dissipation to the time scale for uh, eccentricity dumping. We know how to do that, so there's a good constraint here from this system. Now, the other uh, constraint comes from, I seem to be able to change slide easily. Okay. Right. So, uh, if you look at the moons of the giant planets, they move, and they move because again the orbit is evolving under uh, the action of uh, tidal dissipation. So, to quantify that, we define the tidal dissipation factor, and this is equivalent to what you have when you have a dumped harmonic oscillator. It's exactly the same. Uh, way of measuring how much energy has been dissipated. So here, this, this thing is equal to two pi times the energy stored in the tide 
divided by uh, the energy dissipated during one cycle. So we can relate uh, the orbital, what we observe, you know, so moons are moving with respect uh, to the planet. So there's an, there's an evolution of, of the semi major axis, and the time scale on which the semi major axis changes tells us about how much dissipation there is, and how much dissipation there is gives us this value of Q. So again, there's very, there are very good constraints uh, on this parameter. So if you look at Jupiter, for instance, here you have the enormous uh, satellites, are uh, your Europa and Ganymede. They're actually locked in a Laplace resonance, meaning that the inner satellite goes around four times when Europa goes around twice, when Ganymede goes around once. So there's a very interesting uh, you know, dynamics there, but that's not uh, what I want to talk about here. What I want to talk about here is the fact that Io is moving with respect to Jupiter. And because it's caught in resonance with the other uh, moons, it's taking the other moons you know, with it in its motion. I mean, Io is, is a satellite which is the most affected by the tides because it's closer to Jupiter, but it's locked in resonance with the other moon, so everybody's moving together. So anyway, we have astrometric observations spanning 100 years, and uh, so that has enabled people like Valerie Lenin in particular to measure Q uh, precisely, and the value we get is, you know, a few times 10 to the doesn't say much, uh, to you, but anyway, that's a constraint on uh, how much dissipation there is in Jupiter. Now, if you look at uh, Saturn, you also have quite a lot of data there. You have uh, all those satellites that I have put in there are moving with respect to Saturn, and we can measure uh, again precisely by how much they've moved because we have uh, observations spanning again 100 years plus data from uh, Cassini. And Again, there are resonances here. Mimas is in resonance with Thetis, Enceladus is in resonance with Zion, but uh, so that complicates the story. But nonetheless, we can get, uh, we can again, uh, you know, go from observing the motion of those things to calculating how much dissipation there is in Saturn. And that gives us those numbers that I have written here for the Q value of Saturn. So it tells us how much dissipation there is. Uh, in Saturn. And because we have several satellites, we can have some idea of how that varies with frequency, with the orbital frequency. So this is uh, what we uh, work with. Okay, so how tides dissipate. We know on Earth, for instance, you know, you just you just move the water in the ocean and then you have some friction at the bottom and that's how you dissipate this that part of the story. Of course, if you have a gas in this envelope, like in the sun or like in giant planets, the story is a little bit different. So if you have uh, an early type star, so a hot star that has a radiative envelope, so radiative is stable, I'm not talking about convection now, then you have radiative dumping. Photons are taking energy away uh, when the radiative time scale is short compared to the time scale of the tide. So you can calculate uh, this effect, you can calculate by how much you're going to dump uh, the tide and you get numbers which are in agreement with what you observe. So that's good. Means you know you are doing things right here. Now, what about uh, stars which have a convective envelope or giant planets like Jupiter, which are fully convective? Now it's another it's another story. So here you could have uh, you could think about dissipation of inertial waves uh, by interaction with turbulent convection, and that's something that uh, Adrian uh, in particular has worked a lot on. So it has nonetheless been shown that it's not efficient enough to explain dissipation in Jupiter. So it, it's certainly, you know, it's something important that plays a role, uh, but it's not the whole story. Now, you also have a uh, breaking of G mode in the radiative region. And also that's, that's something that uh, Adrian has looked at in details, but it doesn't seem to give you the numbers that you quite need nonetheless to explain circularization of, uh, of binaries. So now, what about just dissipating the equilibrium tide in the convective envelope? Remember, I talked about the waves, the dynamical height, which is what I've been talking about here, those inertial waves and GMOS. And what about just the deformation of the convective zone, which is due to the tidal interaction? So what I want to do here is uh, spend a little bit of time talking about that, because this is the first thing that people thought about. If you have a convective flow and you excite a tide, how does this tide interact with the convective flow how do you get dissipation from this interaction? So that's the first mechanism that people talked about in the context of tidal dissipation in, uh, in the sun or in Jupiter. And I want to uh, walk you through you know, what people were doing. 
So for that, you know, we need to go back to uh, how do we in general look at the interaction between uh, a shear flow, a well-organized flow with some velocity gradient and turbulence. So that's kind of textbook start. Uh, this is just classical uh, shear flow, uh, turbulent shear flow. And that leads to what we call the mixing rank theory, which has been used extensively to describe uh, the interaction between tides and, uh, and convection. So let's imagine that we have a flow which is turbulent. So you have this here, those small, uh, small eddies. And that superimposed onto a shear flow, which has a well organized velocity. So that's what's represented by those arrows here. So basically, you can write the flow here, the velocity of the flow, U as capital V, which is the velocity of the well-organized flow, the shear flow, and U prime, which you should think of as fluctuations, start moving around. Now, the flow with the velocity U prime is usually considered to vary on the short time scale, which I have called T1, whereas the flow with the velocity capital V, the mean flow, it varies on a long time scale. So if you do that, that's, what's, that's called the Reynolds uh, decomposition then you can try to simplify your equation to describe the flow. Now, in the context of the tides, this is a picture of a simulation of convection. So of course, people tend to think about these processes as the fluctuations being convection. You have all those small blobs going around, moving around, going up and down. And then on top of that, you have your tide, which is just imposing some kind of a background uh, shear velocity uh, on uh, in this flow. So the idea that people have is, that convection provides a fluctuation, whereas the tides provides a background shear. So if this is what you have, then you can just take navier stokes equation and average over the time too, which is going to be large compared to the time of the fluctuation, but small compared to the, con small compared to the uh, time of the shear flow. Okay, you're in between. If you can separate those times, then you can do an average, that's mean. So you take the stokes equation and you do this average and that's what you get. So this is just very standard stuff. You have here the change of momentum for a fluid element that's sitting somewhere in your flow. And how do you change the momentum of this volume? Well, that's what those terms here tell you. You transport momentum through the boundaries of the volume just because the flow is transporting momentum. That's just a section of momentum. You have this P delta, delta IJ here which is just uh, the pressure force. So you have a force acting on the flow that gives you a transform of momentum. This minus sigma IG, IJ here is just a viscous force. That comes from molecules colliding with each other. If molecules collide with each other, you know, they exchange momentum. That corresponds to a viscous force being that applied on this volume. And you can show by the infinity theory that this viscous stress can be written as uh, this term here, minus four times the average of CI, CJ, where what I call C is the velocity of the molecule. And so I is in the I direction, J is in the J direction. If those components correlate, meaning this average of CI, CJ is significant, then you get the viscous stress. If they don't correlate, then you know what you lose in one direction, you're going to gain in the other direction, so you won't have much. So that's, that's what you get for the viscous stress. Now you have, an, you have on the right hand side, uh, the change of momentum due to the fact that there may be external forces acting on this fluid element and that's what the tide would do for you. You have a potential coming from your companion that's going to do that. Now, the term I'm interested in here is this other one, O U prime I U prime J. This corresponds to a transport of momentum by the fluctuation. You have your shear flow, but you also have those things moving around, those it is moving around. And they transport momentum. Okay, that's that's what the flow does. So that's the contribution. Now, you see, you average here over u prime i times u prime j. So those are the fluctuating velocities. So if you want to solve your problem, you have to calculate that term. But you don't quite know how to calculate that term because you have to think about fluctuations. Okay, you don't know how to how to formalize the velocity of that stuff. So. You notice nonetheless that these terms come in in exactly the same way as the viscous stress. The viscous stress is minus 4 CI CJ, where C is the velocity of the molecules. And here I have 
or you find I, you find J, where you find the velocity of my eddies. There's a symmetry here in how things appear. We call this term the Reynolds stress. So tau ij is Reynolds stress, and you have the minus the Reynolds stress. Now, what people have been arguing is that because those terms, the discrete one and the Reynolds stress, come in, in exactly the same way, it's very tempting to think of them in the same way. So think about the viscous force. The viscous force are those molecules bumping into each other and exchanging angular and exchanging momentum. Well, the, the eddies do the same. If you have convection, you have an eddy that goes up and then it dissolves. And when it dissolves, it gives to its environment, its new environment, either the excess or the deficit of momentum it has. So in a sense, it's the same process. You swap the velocity of the molecule for the velocity of your eddies. But you get the same type of force acting on the flow from this process. That's what people have been doing. So we know how to express the viscous stress. The viscous stress is just given by the density of the fluid times, the viscosity times, the rate of strain. We know we can calculate that from first, first principle. That's how the viscous stress can be written. Now, the viscosity is just given by uh, one third of the velocity of the molecules, which is the uh, speed of sound, times the mean free path. Again, you do kinetic theory, you can calculate those things you know, easily. So that's what you get for the viscous stress, and that's what I understood. Now, we said, well, these extra terms coming from the fluctuations, we can think about it in the same way. So let's think about it in the same way. Let's make it up then. We are going to say that the Reynolds stress can be written in the same way as the viscous stress. And we introduce a viscosity, nu t, which is now called the turbulent viscosity. And now we go one extra step. And we say that this viscosity is going to be exactly like for molecules bumping into each other. It's going to be given basically by the velocity of UAD times the length over which they move before they dissolve. It's the same process. They move an end L, M, before they dissolve and give the excess of, angle of momentum. Like the molecule bumping into each other, which shares the momentum after they collide, after having propagated over a mean free path. This is what we call the mixing line theory. And that's been widely used for modeling stars and everything. Now, it works very well when you want to calculate uh, the structure of the star. You have to realize that the whole stellar structure is based on mixing line theory when it comes to understanding high energy is being transported from the center of the star to the surface. And it works well when it comes to actually describing what the sun is doing. We know that because we construct models of the sun and we can compare with observations of modes of the surface of the sun that tell us what's going on inside. So if you just want to know how much energy is being transported by convection, you produce energy in the core of the sun, you transport it to the surface, you use mixing line theory, it works fine. But mixing line, but energy is a passive scalar. You put energy in a flow, it's being transported, it doesn't affect how the flow is behaving. Momentum is different because momentum is part of the flow. So now there's a little bit of a difficulty with mixing line. If you try to understand the interaction between convection and a wave, it's much more tricky than just trying to understand high energy is being transported using mixing line. But that's state of the art, at least in astrophysics. I'm being told that in atmospheric physics, for instance, people are much more uh, sophisticated. And when they do the uh, weather uh, prediction models and things, they have better ways of treating convection. But I don't know the details. So that's what people have been doing. But they've realized that there was a prime when uh, the fluctuations were varying much faster, uh, sorry, uh, when the fluctuations were varying on a long time scale compared to the mean flow. Remember, the mean flow is supposed to be the tide. If the tide is varying very fast, it's giving energy to the convective eddies, but during one tidal period, they don't, they don't go very far. So they can't actually exchange energy with, transport the energy that they've got from the tide. They can't, they can't get rid of the momentum that's been put in there. So that means that dissipation is going to be suppressed. So we said, well, okay, then let's just make it up. We are going to diminish uh, the turbulent viscosity to take that into account. So you take the convective 
the turbulent viscosity nu t, and then you divide it by something which is going to take into account the fact that when the tidal time scale is short compared to the convective time scale, then you suppress this equation. And people have been arguing about how exactly to do that and you know which coefficients to use, but that's uh, what's been done uh, by the field now. Okay, does that work? If you look at white binaries, so when the orbital period is large, for giant stars, which are complete, completely convective, so there's no other way of dissipating the tides. There's no radiative zone here. Then you have a long time scale, so you don't have this problem of suppression. You don't have to worry about changing the theory on this quantity. But then it works fine. You know, if you calculate how much energy you dissipate uh, by putting this equilibrium tide in the convective envelope, you do this calculation, you find that the circularization area you get are actually in agreement with what you observe. But if you look at solar type stars and an orbit such that the orbital period is going to be, uh, the period of the tide is going to be small compared to the connective time scale, it doesn't work. You get a circularization time scale which is 100 times too large. So, you, so the, the amount of dissipation is 100 times too small for what you need. And again, here you have to take into account the, the fact that, you know, uh, the turbulent viscosity is being um, de decreased by the fact that the tide varies on a short time scale. If you look at Jupiter, it's dramatic because then you are 13 orders of magnitude too low when it comes to dissipation of energy. So it really fades, fades completely. So that's what, you know, it's been realized a long time ago. We've been doing that for 50 years now. So we've been trying to find ways of explaining tidal dissipation uh, different. But, you know, it just occurred to me that if it works for fully convective stars in which the convective time scales are smaller than the tidal time scale, it was kind of weird to just think that suddenly it wasn't working at all when the time scale were reversed. But let's come back to what we were saying before. Let's come back to Navier-Stokes equation here, which is average over a time which is long compared to the time of the fluctuations, but small compared to that of the background flow. And we have written the Reynolds stress uh, using mixing length uh, field. Now, we have said, I'm just repeating what I've said before, that when the convective time scale is large compared to the tidal time scale, so meaning when the time scale of the fluctuation is large, then DADs do not exchange much momentum with the background flow. But there's something fishy here, isn't there? Because I'm not saying, well, what happens when the time scale of the fluctuation is large compared to the time scale of the background flow? But the very assumption I had to start with was that the time scale of the fluctuations was small compared to that of the background flow. If that's not the case anymore, what I'm calling the background flow is actually the fluctuation. So all I have to do is to kind of switch the roles now. When I am in this regime, when the convective time scale is large compared to uh, the time scale of the tide, well, then the fluctuation in my Reynolds decomposition is a tide. It's no longer fluctuate, it's no longer turbulent. I don't care, it's a fluctuation. Mathematically, I can do the Reynolds decomposition, I can plug it into my navier stokes equation, and I can calculate myself. It's fine. You don't call it turbulent, but it doesn't matter. All you have to do is reverse the roles. So that's what I've done. And if you do that, you go back to uh, you go back to your Reynolds decomposition and it works. So now you are going to say, well, actually, you know, it's a simple idea. Okay. Why did it take so long for people to realize that? Why was there such a misconception? So I think it's because people tend to think about this crime in terms of length scale instead of time scale. So you view convection as a small scale thing, and you view the tide as a long scale thing. So actually, that even is not correct uh, in some in lots of cases, but it doesn't matter. The so point is that that's how people were identifying fluctuations with uh, the tide, sorry, fluctuation with convection, and mean flow with the tide. It's because they had this view that convection was on small scale that was a fluctuating thing, and it does fluctuate. That's true, it does fluctuate. But the point is, what matters is not the landscape, it's the time scale. 
when you do the right algebraic composition and you have right joint axis of divergence, the only thing that matters is the time scale. So that's why you know you have to switch the roles when the connective time scale becomes long. Okay, so let's do it then. Now we assume that the fluctuation is a type. So what I call U prime now is the velocity of the time. And what I call capital V is the velocity of convection. And convection varies on a convective time scale. Those eddies are moving on a convective time scale, and that's a long time scale compared to the time. And I still do my averaging over a time which is long compared to that of the tide and small compared to that of convection. Here I'm looking at an incompressible field to just you know uh, illustrate the physics. And from the Gestalt equation, I can write energy equations for the field. So it's standard thing, again, textbook stuff. You can write two equations, one for the mean flow, so that's vi square over two by v is capital V. And you can write another equation for the fluctuation, which I will show you after. You can actually separate them. If you do that, it's interesting to see now, you know, uh, how the energy of the flow is going to be affected by the tide. So that's really what I'm interested in here. I want to know how the tide is being dissipated. So what you have on the left-hand side is just the variation of the kinetic energy per unit mass in a volume element sitting there. How do you change that energy? Well, that's given by what's on the right. So what you have, the dxg here is a flux of, what you have inside is, a, I mean, this term is a flux of energy. It tells you about the energy that can be transported to the boundaries of your volume. So you have, you transport energy, uh, this first term here, vi, vi, Square Vj is just a transport of kinetic energy by the flow itself. It's affected by the flow. You have work done by internal stresses on the mean flow. So you have work done by the pressure, work done by the viscous force, and work done by the Reynolds stress. It's just, you know, again, the fluctuations transporting, um, it's, it's the mean flow transporting the, the energy of the fluctuation. And you have work done by external forces, like for instance, for the tide. You have viscous dissipation, so that's uh, that's standard. If you do viscous flows, you know you know how to calculate this term. It comes from the fact that if you have a field element, uh, the viscous force on that side does not move at the same velocity as the viscous force on that side, so you get a deformation of your uh, field element. And you have this idea to which I'm going to come back in a minute. Now you write the same equation for the fluctuation. So here now you're looking at the kinetic energy of the fluctuation. And here again, that's the type. It's the same thing. You get a term which gives you the work done by the fluctuating internal stresses on the fluctuation. So basically, you transport kinetic energy uh, because you have work done on the surface of the volume element. And the work is done on the fluctuation by fluctuating quantity. You have work done by external forces, again, on the fluctuations. You have this full dissipation acting on the fluctuation. And you have the same term as above, but with a different sign. So clearly, this term here tells you about how energy is being exchanged between the mean flow and the fluctuations. And that's how, in a standard turbulent shear flow, we are able to know how energy is being transferred from the mean flow to the turbulent eddies, because we can separate those equations and we can have this term that. We call it the deformation work that tells you about the exchange between the two components of the flow. So this term, you can calculate it. It's just given by the Reynolds stress that I was talking about previously times the gradient, the velocity gradient that you have in the background. Now, again, remember that as far as I'm concerned now, this U prime UJ is a type. The Reynolds stress is associated with the type, no longer with convection. And I don't need to apply anything in theory I can calculate that term because I know how the tide behaves in the star. So what I'm telling you here is uh, summarized there. I know what the rate of exchange of energy between the tide and the fluctuations <coughs> is. That's this DR term. And again, when the convective time scale is long compared to the time scale of the tide, then the U primes correspond to uh, the fluctuations as the oscillations, the tidal oscillation and uh, the mean flow is convection. So in principle, I can calculate this term 
except that, of course, I don't know what the velocity of convection is. So I have to calculate this DBI DHJ term, which is a convective, the gradient of the convective velocity. So everything I've said up to now, you can do see for yourself, I think is robust. It's just going through the formalism and seeing what I have to call what. The part that comes now is more speculative because I have, I want to calculate this term and I don't know how to calculate the gradient of the convective velocity. So this is, this is very much uh, now work in progress. If you are in a standard shear flow, so you have, you have a shear flow, so you have those layers that move faster than those layers and you have turbulence, then the kinetic energy is going to be transferred from the shear flow to the turbulent eddies. How does that work? Well, the eddies here are small scale and they're going to be stretched by your background flow in such a way as to conserve angular momentum. And you can show that this corresponds to a transfer of energy from the shear flow to turbulence. So it's all done in textbook, you can, you can look at it. And then you have a cascade of energy going from the large scale uh, turbulent eddies down to the small scale turbulent eddies. It's all well understood. Now, of course, in my situation, the fluctuations are not turbulent anymore. There's a tide and the tide is forced by a companion. I cannot stretch the tide. So it's much harder to understand now how energy is going to be converted, extracted from the tide by convection. The rate at which energy is being exchanged is given by that there. But I need it to be positive if energy is going to be taken from the tide and put into convection, which is what I need to dissipate the tide. Now, of course, because it depends on the gradient of the convective velocity, and the veloc convective velocity keeps changing. You have convection, things go up, down, move around, move, you know. So this term is going to change down. So you could say, well, it's never going to be positive everywhere at every time. If it's positive here, it's going to be negative here, and then with time, that's going to change. And that's right. But the speculation I have is the following. If during a window of time, so the time scale on which this term is going to change is associated with the convective time scale. If between sometime t and sometime t plus the convective time scale, this term is negative. It means that energy is going from convection to the time. What happens if you put energy in the time? It goes into the orbit of your binary system. You increase the amplitude of the tide, there's a torque exerted by the companion, the energy is just in the orbit. There's no place for it. There's no other place for it to go. So you, if you feed the tide some extra energy, then it's just going to be stored in the orbit. Now what happens next time the change, the, this term changes sign. After a convective time scale, the gradient changes sign. So the arna becomes positive. Well, all the energy that you have transferred to the tide is going to come back convection plus whatever else you have put into the tide during that window where the term is positive. But what happens once you put energy in convection in the sun? If you put kinetic energy into convection in the sun, it's being converted into thermal energy because you have pressure forces doing work on field elements. So once kinetic energy is converted into thermal energy, this is taken away to the surface of the sun by the entropy flux. That's well understood. It's been simulated a lot. We know how that works. So whatever kinetic energy you dump into a convective flow is not going to stay kinetic energy. It's going to be transformed, converted into thermal energy, and taken away. So there's a sink of energy in convection. So if you wait long enough, and by long enough, I mean a time longer than the convective time scale, yes, energy may go back and forth at different places and at different times, but average over a time longer than the convective time scale, then be a net transfer of energy from the tide to convection. Because that's the only place where convection where energy can go. So that is equivalent to saying that DR is positive everywhere at all times. It's not true, but average over a time long compared to the convective time scale, you get the same result. All the energy is finally going to be put into convection. Now, this is speculative. And I know that Adrian would argue uh, about that. And, and 
and maybe it's wrong, but I can't think of anything else to do with that energy. So now, you know, the idea, of course, is to uh, go further and try to make the case for uh, this process. But that's what's in progress. But, you know, before I do that, I can still ask myself the question, well, if I am right, and I can consider that DR is positive, what kind of time scale do I get? Do I actually explain the observation? It's worth asking, because if I don't, well, you know, why bother? So it's still interesting to ask yourself whether you do get the right numbers if you do that. And that's what I want to show you now, because you do get the right numbers. So this is now, uh, this formalism applied to Jupiter. And I'm looking at here the tide raised by Io, which has an orbital period of uh, 42 hours. So that corresponds, uh, that corresponds to a tidal period of 21 hours, you divide by. So on this plot here, I've, I've put lots of different things, but so this horizontal line shows the time scale, the tidal time scale, 21 hours. And the green line shows the convective time scales in Jupiter. You can see that they're really large compared to the tidal time scale. So you see that to treat convection as a fluctuation here is really a bit stretched. Now, I have plotted other things here. Uh, so blue curve shows you, you know, the mixing length, but we don't have to worry about that now. The red curve shows you the DR that I have calculated with the formalism I just presented, assuming it to be positive everywhere. And I divide by the standard DR you get when you use mixing length theory. I'm getting a huge amount of energy more compared to what we had before. And the reason is because the Reynolds stress associated with the tide is huge. The correlation is perfect. So when you calculate the Reynolds stress, you get something which is really big. So I've calculated the Q factor for Jupiter, and I get something which is on the other 20 to 4, which is comparable to what the observation said. And I have done this calculation for uh, the other satellites and uh, you know, get something which is, uh, which is fine. Now, for Saturn, I get a good agreement between the observations and uh, the formalism. If I assume that the mixing length in Saturn is uh, smaller than what we usually use in stars. And there has been actually, uh, there has been arguments for saying that this is the case. And actually the models that are provided for Saturn by some people do use a mixing length which is 0.5. And if I use 0.5, then I get good agreement between the formalism and uh, the observation. So this is, uh, you know, something that uh, we can still uh, argue about, but it's it's encouraging. Now, what about solar type binaries? What I have here is the same plot as before, but for a uh, premium second star on top and the sun at the bottom. Premium second stars are completely convective, whereas in the sun. Uh, only the outer part is convective. So you expect to have a more dramatic effect, you know, for premium second star because convection is so important there. So it's the same thing. I'm putting here the horizontal line is my tidal period. So we are not looking at periods which on the order for two days for the systems that I'm interested in. And you compare with the green curve, which gives you the convective time scale uh, in premium second stars or in the sun. So in the sun, it's not true that the convective time scale is large compared to the tidal period everywhere. You can see that in the upper parts, uh, the, the green curve goes beyond, uh, no, sorry, the horizontal curve. So in these parts, the theory that I'm talking about that I've developed is on the tide. But um, I've done calculations and show that what I get for the inner parts is so much larger than what you get in the other parts that it doesn't matter anyway. And again, the red curves compare uh, the dissipation I get with what you get with uh, the missing and theory. And again, it's orders of magnitude larger uh, than um, the previous theory. So uh, how do you compare, how do you go now on to calculate uh, circularization time scale? Because that's another thing. People uh, historically have compared the dumping eccentricity on the time scale to circularization time scale. And that's wrong because Eccentricity dumping time scale is how much eccentricity can you dump today? I have a sun, it dissipates energy. What's the dissipation rate for the eccentricity right now? But what you get now depends on what has happened ever since the sun was born. And because when the sun was young, you had, uh, you had a very big convective envelope, you had more dissipation. 
So you circularize at that point. So of course, people realize that, and they did say that most of circularization happens early on. But when you actually compare, you know, uh, the observations with, with the calculation, it doesn't make sense to compare the eccentricity on mean time scale, even though that's what you know we've been doing for a while. And actually, I did that as well in the first paper I published on that. And then I said, well, my formalism doesn't work for so select type star. And then I realized it was wrong. So to calculate the circularization time scale, you have you have to solve this problem here. So what I have on the left hand side is uh, the eccentricity dumping uh, time scale. And if you start with an eccentricity E naught, and you want to know how long it takes to get to an, an eccentricity E F E final, then uh, then the time that you have to integrate over is from the initial time T naught to the circularization time. So the circularization time corresponds to the time at which eccentricity has dropped to E F. So you give yourself some uh, criteria for what circularization means, and you can do this calculation because you've calculated T E. So I got T E here from the theory, but T E, the eccentricity, eccentricity dumping time scale does depend on the structure of the star. So you have, when you do this integral, you have to sum up over T E. So you have to sum up over different stars as time goes on. So we produce uh, a grid of stellar models. We calculated T for all those stellar models and calculated this integral to make a long story uh, short. And what we got is that. So this is a red curve here. It's an interesting curve because actually it doesn't look at all like anybody, anything that people had before. People always had a power for the circularization time scale as a function of the orbital time scale. So it's actually, I have a, it was a, an MP student at all for like Scott Martin who produced that. It was his MP project. He came back after Christmas and he showed me that curve. And he was a bit annoyed because it didn't look like anything, you know, we have produced before. And I was stunned because I hadn't anticipated that. But of course it made complete, complete sense. What happens here is that, you see, when the star is very young, you have an orbital period that increases, meaning you dissipate a lot. So you, you can circularize to longer and longer periods. And that happens as long as the star is completely convective. And then when the star leaves the pre and sequence and start, starts joining the main sequence, you go up here, meaning that as the star gets older, you don't dissipate that much more and you don't increase the orbital uh, period, the circularization period that much more. Why? It's because it's on pretty dumping time scale that you get is actually longer than the age of the star at that point. And the sun is very stable on the main sequence. You know, by the time the sun starts burning hydrogen until it's going to get close to the red giant branch, not much is going to happen. So this thing here, this curve stays vertical, but then when you approach the red giant branch, the cognitive zone gets much larger. The star is going to pop up. It's going to get cooler, you'll have more convection, you resume dissipation of tides. And therefore, you increase the circularization period. And it works incredibly well. You see that the, the circularization period you get for the halo and the field are really explained by this formalism now. Now, you still have a scatter here. And you may say, well, it doesn't work that way because you really have a scatter. But there's actually a problem with the way the circularization period has been calculated from the observations. Because the way people have done that, how do you get the circularization carrier? Let me show you one plot here. This is a stellar cluster, N67. This is what's observed. Each dot here represents a binary. And people are telling you that the circularization carrier is here uh, 10 days. Even though you have eccentric binaries at shorter periods. What's the argument for saying that? Well, they're saying, well, you know, if you have a very large eccentricity, it takes so long to circularize that what you observe is basically incomplete circularization. So you have to correct for that. That's wrong. That's wrong. And that's due to the fact that people have used the wrong time scale for doing this calculation. They use time scales which were correct first of all in eccentricity, when actually what the model are eccentricities of 0.5. The point they missed is that actually, if you have a very eccentric orbit, then the prey center is very small. And most of the tidal interaction happens when the star is a prey center. 
So you have a huge amount of dissipation at price center, and that's going to characterize very fast at first. So you go from large eccentricities like 0.5 to 0.1 in no time. You decrease the orbital period, you decrease the eccentricity very rapidly. So as far as spider dissipation is concerned, what you want to understand as the later stages, because that's why you spend most of your time structurizing, going from an eccentricity of 0.1 to an eccentricity of 0.1, that's where you can get input from the observation. And that happens at fixed orbital period because the time scale for changing the, um, the period is much longer. So because people have missed that, my argument now is to say, well, actually, the circularization period for that cluster is not 10 days, but it's spent to the point 0.8 years. And I, I've been in contact with uh, Bob Matthew, who's been doing all that calculations for the last 30 years or so. And so hopefully, you know, we get some new estimates of those circularization period. But if you actually correct for that, then you get something which is basically uh, much, more, much more consistent with the curve I've shown you. Okay, so uh, I've also applied the formalism to hot Jupiter to see uh, to which extent you can circularize uh, giant planets which are uh, very close to their host star. And what we get is also in agreement with observations, we get the circularization time scale of one giga year for an orbital period of three days. And it's mainly due to the tides raised in the planet by the star rather than the other way around. Right, so this is where we are. So the conclusion is that, uh, as I've said before, uh, the interaction of fast tides with slow convection uh, implies that what we consider as a mean flow is convection, whereas what we consider as a fluctuation is a tide. And then the rate of uh, energy uh, dissipation is given by uh, this thing here. And this is a robust result. Again, you know, anybody can go through the calculation. It's, there's nothing hidden there. Now, the most speculative, speculative part, part is about high energy transfer from the tight convection. I am assuming that because there's a sink, convection is a sink, then the prime is equivalent to assuming that the R is positive to the R and uh, at what times. That still has to be shown. So right now, what I'm actually doing is trying to design some kind of a toy model to study the interaction between uh, convective flow and a very fast uh, varying oscillation. And I'm also um, in contact with uh, Sacha Brun in France, who is uh, who's running big simulations of, uh, of the sun, and he's going to try to keep an oscillation, this simulation of the sun, to see what happens there. Now, there are more applications, of course, and uh, in particular, um, looking at different types of stars. And a very interesting crime as well is that of the acoustic modes, uh, which are excited in stars. I mean, you see those acoustic modes. So those are modes for which the restaurant forces pressure. We see them all over the place. They've been observed uh, in other stars with uh, you know, satellites that we have up there. And we have very good measurement of their dumping rates. And we, there, are also, there are lots of uh, things we can do with that because we know how that changes depending on which star you have and all of that. And the dumping here again is due, uh, is due of the, um, it's because of the interaction of the two modes with convection. So uh, if we can, now extend this formalism to a compressible flow because we need to be compressible to that acoustic mode. Then you know hopefully we can model the dumping of those modes as well uh, by convection and uh, yeah by convection and see whether we get interesting. So here we are. Thank you for your time.